Um, welcome everybody to the Retro Gaming Expo and uh, if you're able to survive long enough for the last talk in this room for the festivities before you all uh, disappear, uh, hopefully all are re-inspired about retro gaming. I'm Rebecca Heinemann. I am the, one of the founders of uh, Old School and I'm the CEO, CTO, and uh, programming uh, goddess. Um, Writing the code for all of our games. Right here is... Uh... Hi, Janelle J. Place. Um, I had a talk earlier this weekend on the ecology of the ColecoVision cartridge. Way back in the day, I was the director of game design on the ColecoVision for Coleco. Mm -hmm. uh, for the entire... Well, I was the manager of the design group for the entire life cycle of the ColecoVision. Mm -hmm. um, and I am one of the founders of Old School and the creative director on call for Old School these days. I do code. She drives the pretty pictures. Code, content. Because mm -hmm. if I drew the pretty pictures, I'll give you stick figures. If you want coding for me, it's like hello world, you know, 10, <laughs> hello so, world, whatever. Goes so it's 10. easy <laughs> for us to, to differentiate our work. Now, well, we're here to talk about the history of Bard's Tale, um, a game that uh, I worked on back in the 1980s, um, and then I went on to create Bard's Tale 3, The Thief of Fate. Um, and Janelle here... Well, I actually have a, a Bard's Tale history of my own. Um, after Interplay technically lost the Bard's Tale license after mm -hmm. Bard's Tale 3, I ended up getting um, kind of shanghaied into uh, working on Bard's Tale 4 at EA as a consultant. I was working on a different game um, as a designer, outside design consultant for them. Um, and producer Chris Earhart had me in house to work on that game. Um, Necroscope, I think was the name of it. It never came out, but it was sort of a wastelandish game with monsters. And he said, hey, we need some help finishing up the, uh, the design document for Bard's Tale 4. Mm -hmm. so this will be replacing what you're working on with us. So you in? Yeah, I'm in. You're paying me good money. <laughs> so when it comes to Bard's Tale, let's start at the beginning. Bard's Tale, of course, uh, didn't start off as Bard's Tale. Once upon a time, there was a gentleman by the name of Michael Cranford, and he had done a game for Hessware called Maze Master. It was a C64 cartridge, and it was a very simplistic game, which, for all intents and purposes, was a wizardry ripoff. But then again, if you look at the games out there, we've pretty much been ripping off each other for the past 40 years. <laughs> well, after Maze Master was released, Michael Cranford met up with his old buddy, Brian Fargo, and they got into an agreement in which Interplay Productions, um, video game company I was one of the founders with back in the 80s, uh, would agree that we would supply art and help him with this, uh, pub you know, finding a publisher for the game in exchange for him essentially letting Interplay be the exclusive um, agent, shall we say. So Green was uh, agreed to. And Cranford started working on Bard's Tale. He was using my tools to do um, animations and art and so forth. So, and that's where my involvement was in the original Apple II versions of Bard's Tale. Um, but then, in time, we then struck a deal with Electronic Arts. Now, at that particular point in time of Interplay's history, we were doing almost exclusively our games through Activision. Games like Mind Shadow, Tracer Sanction, Borrowed Time were all being published by Activision. But EA wanted us to do something for them, and when they saw that we were essentially doing our wizardry clone with a lot better graphics and a lot more um, production values, they said, sure. So money was exchanged, contracts were signed, and now officially the game, which was going to be called Tales of the Unknown, The Bard's Tale. Because the whole idea was to create an entire line of games called Tales of the Unknown, and then they were going to have the Barge's Tale, the Thief's Tale, the Archmage's Tale, or whatever. And it didn't even have to be a Barge Tale game. It could be any game they wanted from EA's own catalog from other people's games. So that was its name. Tales of the Unknown, the Barge Tale. Well, the game was going to be completed, 
and unfortunately there was a problem with um, Michael Cranford's, how we say, he didn't feel he was getting, being treated fair enough in this contract. So unfortunately, there was a altercation, no, no physical, nothing, but it was just shouting. I should know, my office was, Brian Fargo's office was here. My office was right there with the wall and the walls in there to play were pretty thin. And I heard everything and I'm sitting here going, ooh, I hope nobody dies in there, but they, they were upset. But nevertheless, um, an adjustment to the contract was made. And in doing so, the game was then, Michael Cranford gave us the final versions of the game. And in exchange, you know, he got his adjustment to the contract and the game was shipped. Well, at this point then, um, I was then working on a brand new computer that they were coming out with. It was called the Apple II Cortland, uh, now today known as the Apple II GS. And um, I said, hey, I already know this Bart's Tale code. I already know how Cranford writes his code and so forth. And I've already had to help working on integration with this code. So then I said, hey, I want to do the port of the Apple II GS version of Bart's Tale. And with that, um, I went ahead and created this. Which I'll now show you if I can actually, oh, let me use the mouse that I actually plugged in here. Here's an Apple II GS emulator. And I took what the game looked like on the Apple II with its, you know, 8-bit graphics and so forth and made it look like that. And I wasn't satisfied. So I started, had a soundtrack added to it. Full mini synth, um, polyphonic music. Um, I even made it so that when you're playing the game, The game with the, the bard plays with different instruments, the game would change what instrument you play with. So let's go here. And as you walk around the city, graphics look more like this. And monsters, let me look, see if I can get a monster to attack me. There we go. The art looks like that. Um, plus, I also added, which was very unique at the time because the Macintosh came out and I said, hey, this is pretty cool. I wanted to go ahead and add a point and click interface. You can actually click on this character. The name of this character oh, it looks like it's not mapping properly here. Oh, please. fight, we'll run. Here we go. Fight, attack, 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 defend, defend, defend. That's my usual catchphrase. And fight, mm -hmm. attack, 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 defend, defend. Anybody who's played these types of games, you already know attack, attack, attack. But here, I can go to this, grab people's names, move them, organize them. These are all features that were never really done before in an RPG game. Well, afterwards, let me go quit. No, quit. no, no that's not what I wanted. How do you do this emulator? How do you do open Apple? Oh, well, there's one way to do it. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, the trouble is I actually have a real GS sitting in my uh, desk at work, at home. So I actually run it on the real thing, so I don't have a problem. But then later on, did it again for Bard's Tale 2, The Destiny Knight. Now this game was interesting because one of the... Here we, I did a bunch of new changes to the art style because now you can actually see building sides. And this monster here glows if I sit here too long. The artwork is a lot more enhanced and uh, again, more advanced music. The After Bart's Tale, one was shipped um, due to the contract Michael Cranford was then allowed to basically have free reign on design of Bart's Tale 2. That is, whatever the monster's difficulty levels, the puzzles and so forth. And it also became apparent that Cranford developed a, um, a liking to uh, theology because in Bard's Tale 2 there were heavy biblical references, whereas the first game was just names we just picked out of the heath or just saying Mar Mangar, Tarjan, whatever, they just came out of nowhere. Um, many of the cities in Bard's Tale 2 were based on the cities in the Bible, the game itself had a very high difficulty level, 
Um, but one thing I remember telling Cranford back then was saying, why can't I play as a female character? And his answer to me, and this is a direct quote, girls don't play these games. And I'm like, I beg to differ. Well, after Bard's Tale 2 shipped, I then went ahead and made these two ports. And with that, I had the entire code base and everything. But at this point in time, there really was no interest at Interplay to continue with Bard's Tale 3, because since Cranford was no longer involved with the project, he moved on to do other things with other companies. Um, I stepped forward and said, hey, look, I want to do Bard's Tale 3. I really love this game. I believe in it. And all the things that I did with Bard's Tale for the 2GS, both uh, all the new technology, the new instances, and how to make the gaming experience really enhanced. At that point, they took a chance and said, sure. So got together with a writer, Michael Stackpole, to come up with a nice story. Because uh, at that particular point in my career, I wasn't that good at telling stories and so forth. I was, I was a code monkey. You know, code monkey, get coffee, code monkey, get a job. But, um, and then Todd Camasta, our um, resident artist who had a running joke, were saying, no more. No more dog-like creatures. I can't draw another dog-like creature! He says, please, I need a werewolf that looks like an actual werewolf. Uh, kill me now. Yeah, I think he finally um, did get his wish, in the sense not to kill me, but he moved on eventually to do children's books now. So maybe I contributed to his um, breakdown <laughs> in the industry. Although that's not literally what happened to him. But, uh, you know, dog-like creatures, say that in front of Doc Todd Camasta, and he'll probably go into shivers. Well, with Bard's Tale 3, I then said, hey, I'm going to take the technology I created in Bard's Tale for the 2GS, because it used a brand new engine. Because the code that I got from the original Apple II versions needed improvement. So I went ahead and just wrote a brand new engine that even though it played the old data for the game, it was totally different internally. With that, I then made the foundation of Bard's Tale 3. And with Bard's Tale 3, I wanted it to be a true sequel, and since Bard's Tale 2 really had nothing to do with Bard's Tale 1, because it was a totally different land, totally different scenario, um, the idea came up of saying, hey, let's make this that Tarjan, the bad guy that was like a secondary bad guy in Bard's Tale um, 1, which you defeated on your way to get rid of the real bad guy, Mangar. Why don't we make him come back looking to find this adventuring party who kicked his ass? And that was the whole plot basis of Bard's Tale 3. So you have Scarabray destroyed, Tarjan is now you know, destroying everything, and came up with all these ideas of going through different dimensions, different things, because one of the ideas I really love is somebody with a rocket launcher against a dragon. So the engine was upgraded, redone, and based totally on the Apple II GS version, except changed back to run on an Apple II, um, which was, let's just fa fa let's face it, it was a lot of Diet Mountain Dew and a lot of shoehorning of getting all of this to fit in the 64K Apple II. But with it, um, with my friend Kurt Hyden doing the soundtrack, we then went ahead and made a game that had 74 maps. To put in perspective, Bar's Tale 1 only had 16 maps, Bar's Tale 2 had 25 maps. We had 74. Um, I had female characters. You could play also as people of color, because many of the characters we had, we actually had them with orange skin. Now, of course, with the Apple II, that's as far as we can go with only six colors. But, um, it was all about trying to make the game as balanced, as inviting to everybody. And another thing the game had, which the predecessors did not, is I actually had a hidden skill sense. If the game detected that your party only had a certain level, as in your average level was only three, the game would only um, put level one creatures after you, so you can easily kick their butts. But when once you got to level five, then I started upping the levels of the monsters. But this happened through most of the city and so forth. Now, if you went to the other lands, then you're on your own. But at least it avoided the problem with Bard's Tale 1, 
where when they did the PC version, they actually added a key because the game was so hard that if you pushed it, it would make a stone golem appear inside of your party. And I'm like, that's not fixing the problem. You're just cheating by saying, hey, let's put a super powerful creature in your party just because because the city itself was just too hard to play. Well, after I finished Bard's Tale 3, I went ahead and got the PC, sorry, the uh, Apple II version, did the C64 version, um, and was already halfway through doing um, Bard's Tale 3 for the Apple II GS when <sighs> got the note, because I was also working on technically Bard's Tale 4. Um, and that game and eventually ended up becoming Dragon Wars. So I was working on Dragon Wars as my uh, primary project. I was working on Bard's Tale 3 for the 2GS as a secondary project, because at that time the 2GS was kind of dying out. Um, when we got the word that um, EA and uh, Interplay went to war. And that was because at that particular point in time of Interplay's history, we um, an agreement was made between Interplay for publishing our own games to be distributed through Activision. EA was not too thrilled. So, as a result, EA said, hey, you know that game, Bar's Tale? And the other one, a sci-fi one called Wasteland. You do know who owns the trademarks of them, right? It's called Electronic Arts. <laughs> Go away. So with that, we no longer had the ability to make a game and call it Bard's Tale. Which is interesting because, you know, it was supposed to be called Tales of the Unknown, but since when they made the packaging it says Tales of the Unknown in little font, and then below that in big words, the Bard's Tale, so all people could see was the Bard's Tale, and so when we made the sequel, it said it being called, you know, Tales of the Unknown, the Archmage's Tale, it became Bard's Tale 2, the Destiny Knight. So, of course, I just kept going with it. So, with Bar's Tale 3, it became Bar's Tale 3, The Thief of Fate, which I really wanted to be called uh, Tales of the Unknown, The Thieves' Tale. But, hey, you got to do what the marketing says. And in that case, I, I actually agreed. Bar's Tale 3, The Thief of Fate was the best name. Well, because um, I was told that, A, Bar's Tale 4 that I was working on was not going to ship because you can't use the name, it morphed into Dragon Wars, and my half-completed port of Bard's Tale 3 for the Apple IIGS was not going to get finished because there was no point in doing it. Um, moved on and doing um, those two particular... I just went on to finish up Dragon Wars. Shipped Dragon Wars. Did made some good money on it because it was an Apple IIGS... I'm sorry, Apple II, Apple IIGS, C64 version of the game. But at this point in time now, it was just the interest of doing games, especially on the Apple II, was gone. And we were now focusing on the PC, and at the Interplay, for some reason, they wanted to put all their efforts into a game called Stonekeep, which took five years to develop before they shipped it. Intriguingly enough, I, I spent more than nine months to make one of these games. I was like, you know, I want to go take myself out and commit seppuku. Well, Unbeknownst to me, when EA told Interplay that you cannot use the Bard's Tale 3, or sorry, the Bard's Tale name anymore, there was an ulterior motive. The shirt I'm wearing was distributed to employees at Electronic Arts because they were working on Bard's Tale 4. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> Okay. I say I was not an employee of um, Electronic Arts at this time. I was a freelance designer. Um, I had previously worked with Interplay on The Lord of the Rings, um, Volume One RPG, different type, different type of RPG, more of a top-down um, exploring game. Um, Chris Earhart, the producer of Bart's Tale 4 at EA, which was, well, I knew Chris because I was working with Necroscope on him. I was brought in to work on that, but he was also friends with Brian Fargo. So they knew I had worked with Brian. They brought me in. I think I had gotten a good rep doing the, um, the Lord of the Rings title. Um, 
they brought me in to work with um, their design and development team because they kind of hit an impasse on the story. Now, up to this point, they had had three or four different writers, um, including, I think, Steve Englehart, who did comic books, Dave Artisan, one of the founders of, uh, or one of the creators of Dungeons and Dragons, and then a few other people who either were staff or freelance, and everyone had written a little bit of an area of the game, but there was no unifying story and there was no ending created for the story. So they brought me in to write the end and be script doctor, tie everything back up together. Um, I worked on the project for about a year, writing yeah, which scripts. Years? Which years? 91, <coughs> somewhere in there. I kind of lose track at that point. But I think it was 90, 91. Mm -hmm. um, it was only about a year. Um, and they had me on site a few times. I lived in Michigan at the time, and they flew me out and put me up in the crash pad um, at EA. Uh, I think it was in, Fo no, that was in San, it's, EA was in Foster City, San Mateo, somewhere in there in that area. Um, so I came in, worked on the game, wrote the script, but what I found out was, is they had a game that was doing three different points of view in the gra game graphics. There was the explore 3D version, or the first person 3D version where you wandered around a maze, and I don't think they were using the Bard's Tale code. They no. were using uh, something that had come from Westwood. Um, they had a, what I'll call shadow box, or a stage version, where you could act out encounters with side views of the characters. So now you had two different views of each of the characters they were creating. You had the portrait view that you would see here when you interacted with them. Then you had a side view of them that animated in interactions in these um, shadow box stages. And then there was a third version where they took the city they were working on and they had a isometric top-down view of the characters, so there was yet another version of the characters in any one they encountered. So they had all these different graphic modes, and they had been working on this game for maybe two years, at least a year, maybe two years by that point. They had this incredibly complex inventory system, they had a fairly complex gameplay system, they were handling all these um, different graphics, systems which all had extensive requirements for a lot of graphics. The game was expensive. It was built, it was, it was accumulating cash and then at the same time the, it, the system was extremely buggy. Um, so during the time I worked on it, they were finishing up different graphics, they were doing the scripts, I wrote the script for the end of the game and I kind of wrote threads that went back through all the different maps and everything to tie everything together. The other thing they were doing different is they were using pre-made characters. So you saw the character was on the back of Becky's shirt. That was the Bardling, um, as drawn by um, fantasy artists who worked in role-playing games, um, Liz Danforth, who worked, she's more known for her Tunnels and Trolls. She did um, a lot of uh, card game cards, um, but she was, this was at kind of the peak of her, well, her popularity in, in fantasy role-playing tabletop games. So we had these pre-made characters, which was totally different from any other, you know, the way Bard's Kill was done, which is you made your own characters and you went through. So we were writing, we had pre-scripted events that moved that, we were actually following a story path that affected these characters, so some of the characters would join at certain points, some of them would die, there would be a tragic death scene with an orc named Fernando. Um, I the design bible is hilarious to read. <laughs> I did not name these characters. Um, so you had all these, these different characters and we got through to near, you know, after when I contributed all my work and they changed producers. So they brought a new producer. It had been Chris Earhart, now it was Victor Penman. And he was trying to just finish this game. We were no longer under anything like budget. 
Um, the game code was buggy. And finally, I got a message. Um, probably this is 1991 some, at some point. From the producer, he said, we're shutting down the project. It's just bleeding money. By the time we ship it, the graphics are going to be out, so outdated, it won't even be competitive in the market. Um, thanks for your work, but you're not going to work with us again. Because for now, we're also changing the way we do business, that we're only going to work with completely, complete studios outside of the company. So um, there was a company up in uh, Wisconsin that he compared me to, which is Raven. And he says, yeah, they're doing games for us. They've got, they do everything. If you want to work with EA again, you need to do something like that. Put together a studio. Oh, that wasn't me. So that was the end of my video game career again for a while. And I focused on doing um, illustrative art again for tabletop games. Yeah. Now, to put things in perspective, is while they were... Now, from my point of view, during this was happening, I had no knowledge at all that EA was doing a Barth Tale 4 on their own. I mean, I was totally oblivious to this. But during the time that they were working on it, I worked on what was essentially Barth Tale 4, but now it's called Dragon Wars. In this case, Paul O'Connor was the one who came up with the story. And I went ahead and wrote the engine based on Barth Tale 3's engine, except unlike Barth Tale 3, this game has much even um, larger graphics. Now, it starts with a pre-roll party, but at any time, you can then just remove a party. Party members, see here, what was it like? Uh, D, get rid of this one. We wish to dismiss muscles. Yes. Well, at that point, I then go ahead and create your party. Oops, no. Was it like, uh, Oops, party number party. I'm writing my key. Name your new, name your new character. Me. <laughs> Male or female? Ooh, female, that's me. And here we go, create my own characters. <coughs> I'm just uh, uh, just make her leap off because she's such a pain in the butt. And yeah, leave her the intelligence of Thrud the Barbarian. There we go, and escape, exit. There, now I've got a new character. And at that point, you could run around with your own characters, but because of the fact that at this time, we found that a lot of people when playing Bard's Tale, they didn't want to roll up a character. They just wanted, they, almost everybody used the A-Team, which was the pre-roll character we had in there, because when we were playing Wizardry, we found one of the most boring things for some people is that they don't like rolling up characters. But I was adamant. You had to be able to play this game with characters you just made up. Um, but in here, I did so many new improvements, such as like, now you have puddles, um, monsters when they show up, Eventually. Now, in this part, there you go. So much storytelling with pop up windows. So they're telling you this is the main gate, the purgatory, the gate through which you were unceremoniously dumped. Um, you know, they'll happily kick your spleen up through your teeth if you want to rush the gate. So let's not go there, at least not until you buff up. But some of the design, uh, now you can see here's one of the monsters in the game, and unlike Bard's Tale 3, you can actually have a sky. Um, the monster is actually drawn on the 3D screen. We have pop-up windows now. We have the bottom screen. It's just a lot more technological advances. And I completed this game in 1989. You know, two years before they decided to kill Bard's Tale 4. I kind of like to think that I helped contribute in murdering your career twice. <laughs> <laughs> There's a story there, but it's not, uh, not for this time. <laughs> but, um... But after I did this uh, game, I went ahead and did all the ports. This is the 2GS version. Um, but I had to put this little puppy to bed. Now, this game was actually um, published by Interplay. So it's all owned by Interplay and has nothing to do with Electronic Arts. Well, now we're going to continue with the Bar's Tale story. My story kind of ended at that particular point after doing Dragon Wars. I then went on to do other things at Interplay. Well, Bard's Tale, however, lived on. After it was killed at Electronic Arts, Inter Ele Interplay, sorry, Electronic Arts really didn't care about the franchise anymore because as far as they were concerned, it's a dead IP. They may have to pay some monies to Interplay. They didn't really want to. But then, in 2002, Interplay pretty much imploded. 
and just became nothing but a shell of a company. Uh, Brian Fargo, um, who left Interplay, formed his own studio called In Exile. He then found that the trademark to Bard's Tale lapsed. So playing some cute little legal games, he went ahead and registered his own trademark for the Bard's Tale. He then went ahead and uh, created his own game, um, which he called The Bard's Tale, and was released in 2004 for the PlayStation 2 and the PC and other platforms like that of the time. But to be blunt, the game has absolutely nothing to do with Bard's Tale. It's just Bard's Tale in name only. Um, the game, you know, sold decently, but at the time it wasn't, let's say, a runaway hit, so there was no Bard's Tale 2 of that particular game. Well now, fast forward some more years, um, a few years back, Fargo thought he would try it again with Wasteland. But every time he went to a publisher, publishers said, Wasteland? Um, ha ha ha! And slammed the doors in his face. So eventually Kickstarter showed up. And it then, he said, come on, Wasteland 2, what do you got to lose? And sure enough, he got the money. So, after some time, after Wasteland 2 shipped, and he's doing some other products, he then says, let's try doing a Bard's Tale sequel. And somewhere along the line, the idea was saying, no, we don't really want a sequel to the Bard's Tale that you made. We want to make a sequel of the original classic trilogy. So again, more voodoo occurred in uh, the legal realm, and he was able to acquire the rights to the Bard's Tale, you know, the actual official trilogy, which has then uh, led to a Kickstarter, which then funded so that he can then do Bard's Tale 4. Well, then I went and approached him saying, hey, I did Bard's Tale 3, you know, I want to get involved. Well, one thing led to another, and I was able to then get the rights to be able to do the Bard's Tale trilogy remastered. So taking what I have, which I'm going to show it to you as soon as I can actually open that stuff. There we go. Um, since I wrote the damn games, um, sorry, uh, in inadvertently swore right there, so um, I'll get some soap later on from my mouth. Uh, I have Barstale 1, Barstale 2, and Barstale 3, which includes the original source code that I did for the 2GS version that never shipped. So with this, went ahead and took the source and the data and everything up there, and I said, I'm going to go ahead and rewrite this code in the C, put it in Windows, and at, at first use the original graphics, but then later on, thanks to Janelle and several other very talented artists, this popped out. Run it here. There we go. Turn on the sound. Muted it for a moment. I took the Bard's Tale 3 engine and I made it all the data compatible with Bard's Tale 1, 2, and 3. And there it is um, running as a native Windows app. There is no emulation running here. This is an actual C program running the Bard's Tale game. And you can see the game graphics look a lot more enhanced. Other things that improvements are like, this is now the new city map. So if you, instead of hitting question mark just to get in the text saying you are facing north and you're on Main Street, you're in early evening, instead you actually have your little character visible on the map. Oops, no lights, they could disappear for some strange reason. But you can use the arrow keys to scroll around the map so you can see everything. I've also, we also did this for Bard's Tale um, 2 and Bard's Tale 3. So when you walk around the wilderness um, and the cities, you actually can do that, which was cleverly done by Janelle in which, to put in perspective, let's go escape to exit, I'm going to show you that map for north. Oops, go to the Adventures Guild. Remember all. Oops, jump to another realm. Let's go to Tangermain at my party. Enter the city. Oh, gee, I'm now playing Bard's Tale 2 with the very same party. Hit question mark. Now notice that is the city of Tangermain, 
done in the same style as the art that was done inside of the original box. Oh. Yeah, that's all I can say. This was a cheesy trick I did. Um, I scanned in some of the art from one of the packaging on the original Bard's Tale bot map and then cut and pasted. The original Bard's Tale had the map and I matched it up to match the, match the grid of the city. And then, for, and then that was the first map, did a little bit of cleanup on that. And then for all the other maps, I cut and pasted the same graphic elements around to rebuild the city so every map, every city was unique. And then if she were to jump to another city, um, I did cut some color changes. So, kind of a cheesy way to approach it, but it got one, how many different maps did we do? Um, uh, there was uh, nine, because it was the main, we'll do, the main city map of Scarabray for Bars Hill 1. And in Bars Hill 2, we had six cities and the wilderness. And the wilderness. And in Bars Hill 3, we had the wilderness uh, where the Scarabray refugee camp was in. Yep, so there was... About eight, about eight maps, I think. Internet maps, yeah. Um, other improvements, of course, is that we have, again, the point-and-click interface. Uh, we have the game itself morphs in the sense that you see here it says 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, which is how the game numbers the characters. Um, let me go back to the Adventures Guild here. Remove the parties, jump to another realm, let's go back to Scarabray. Now here you notice it says on the... Um, Bottom it says uh, S for special, one through six. So the game actually changes modes. So when you're playing the different games, it will let you actually play in the same rule set. That is, in Bard's Tale two and three, you can have your monsters in any slot. Or Bard's Tale one, you can only have the monster in the first slot. Um, the engine actually takes that into account. Um, now let's see here. Let me see. Um, in Scarabray. So where was the Wine cellar, that's where I have to go. Uh, so one thing, while well, she's hunting around, we also had um, a high, much higher resolution back frame done for the game, um, including uh, new um, user interface icons, um, there's some animation that goes on with the scrolling maps and the skull, and um, the, when you have active statuses, they show up on the middle post there, and they're a lot more detailed. Now, as I just showed you on the screen, because I was remastering this game, it means that oh, I'm not limited to 64K. So therefore, I could actually do all the stupid things that I've always wanted to do. Such as like, I'm now in the tavern here on, uh, in Barstale, so I want to go and order a drink. Who will drink? Gee, now you can get ginger ale and diet soda. I wonder what happens. You feel like programming a computer, but you have no idea what a computer is. <laughs> All throughout the game, for people who have ever played the original Bar's Tale trilogy are going to notice a lot of little subtle enhancements, jokes, um, text markers, things like that. Stuff we couldn't put in the game because we simply couldn't put that text in memory when we only had 48 or 64K of memory on an Apple II. Since I have no um, um, restrictions, one of the other features is that the, when you actually attack a monster, the um, text that comes up, now it says, more unwelcome guests. Well, the original game only had something like about five or six flavor text saying, something blah blah blah, you face. How many did we write? <laughs> I don't remember, but I wrote a lot, and then whenever I had an idea for another one, I'd throw it over in the wall. Yeah, it's like 200 now, I think we've got in there. Uh, that's, no, I don't think that many. Oh, but... I added a bunch too. <laughs> I make no claims to the ones she wrote. <laughs> yeah, I think you made references to the space hamster. Okay. There might be one. Yeah, boo. That's right, boo. Oh, yeah, go for the eyes, boo. Go for the eyes. <laughs> Had to be in there. But, um, so, all throughout the game, we put in just little enhancements and things like that to really make this game work a lot better. And really, um, this was game I created is a labor of love. Um, now, you may ask yourself, how do I get my hands on this? Well, just to let you know, now available now, and it's not sold in any store, 
you can get it currently by pledging to uh, purchase a copy of the game Bard's Tale 4 um, through the Kickstarter website. Um, and of course, after the game is released for the Kickstarter backers, there may be a release for this. We're still talking about that. But, however, um, this is what Bart's Tale Remastered looks like. I really can't show that much more other than just that all new features. Um, there are some things we're planning on doing eventually later is that some of these art, these wall faces have been redrawn to be uh, higher resolution. And I also am planning on putting in a, what I call classic mode in which the classic mode means the game runs with the original Apple II GS art without any changes whatsoever. So you can actually, when the game begins, it puts up that dialogue that says what video resolution you want. Like, yeah, like it should, that's how that works. So it puts this up. Well, she's doing a thing. One of the things we also add, and she can correct me if I'm wrong, is that you can take your party between the games. Mm -hmm. Same party. Here's the game running in full screen mode. <laughs> And uh, you can see it's very, very detailed, very high-res graphics. But yes, yeah, so let me show that feature. There's a few reward screens that were thrown in that weren't in the original. Mm -hmm. Let's get back to. It's been it's been almost 30 years, and I still remember this map. There it is. The jump to another realm. The way to, just for anybody who's playing the game to know, is that the only way to jump in another realm comes up is that you actually remove all the characters. Because the characters have to be in the um, roster because of the fact that there are different rules about who, what kind of characters you can have inside of your uh, party. Like here, you can only have six characters and a special. Whereas if I go here to um, Refugee Camp for Bard's Tale 3, I can now add actually seven characters. But here is the art original. This is the original PC art that we had from Bard's Tale 3, um, Thief of Fate, which is actually, here's the order of our drink. Who will drink? You know, ale, mead, ginger sale, diet soda. Mm, I love that diet soda. Uh, of course, I'm always open to suggestions about what other horrible things I could do to this game. <laughs> But anyways, um, I have any, anybody have any questions before uh, we uh, get thrown out of this room? Yes, in the blue. So I grew up with the Vita versions. Yes. Which had, I guess, those Act of 2 GS graphics yes. sounds. Um, did the sound for when the characters are healed or resurrected come from the 2 GS version? Yes, they did. Dona e is requiem. Yes. I've always wondered if that was a deliberate by Bunner. It was. it was. I'm amazed we didn't get sued. I had it re-recorded so that you can't copyright a Gregorian chant, but you can copyright a specific instance of a Gregorian chant. So I had Kurt do the chant and echo it, and then you know smash something with a wooden plank. But and of course I even timed it now so that the game would print the text saying. The priests lay hands, Dona e Israel, we am. Boom, and it prints immediately. Now you're healed. <laughs> and, okay, we're timing out. So, any last questions before I get chucked out the door? Well, thank you very much for coming here to the Barstow Remastered and the Barstow History uh, Talk. Um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.